Well, welcome, brothers and sisters. It's good to be with you again this Holy Week as we now move from our Palm Sunday celebration to our celebration of the resurrection on Sunday. But as I sh shared in my message this past Sunday, Palm Sunday, we can't go from Palm Sunday to Easter without living the experiences of Jesus during this Holy Week. So I encourage you again to read at least one of the Passion accounts in the Gospels. Today, I want to share with you a word from the cross. But first, some words of Paul from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. <clears throat> well, my guess is that some of you might be wearing a cross, maybe on a chain around your neck or pinned somewhere in your clothing. Maybe you carry one in your pocket. Or maybe you have a cross prominently displayed somewhere in your home or in some quiet corner where you spend some time in devotions. Why? What significance does that cross have for you? Do you ever think about that? Some of our Christian brothers and sisters from other traditions practice the sign of the cross. Sometimes we see athletes make the sign of the cross. Baseball players when they come to bat or a football player when they've scored a touchdown. Do you ever wonder why? What significance does the sign of the cross have for them? Well, Paul begins this portion of 1 Corinthians with the words, the message of the cross. What is the message of the cross? I encourage you to just take a moment and look at the print version of this message and ponder a painting that I have pictured there. As you look at that painting of Christ on the cross, what message do you receive as you look upon it? <clears throat> this is one of my favorite paintings of Christ's crucifixion. It's Salvador Dali's painting, Christ of St. John of the Cross. It was partly inspired by a drawing sketched by the 16th century Spanish Carmelite mystic, St. John of the Cross, and it created some controversy when Dali first revealed his painting to the public. You'll notice not present in Dali's painting are any suggestion of the pain and agony present in most crucifixion paintings, the tortured form of the body, the nails, the blood, the sweat. Any suggestion of the suffering that Christ endured isn't there. But what I notice about this painting is its unique perspective. Most artists paint Christ on the cross from the perspective of those on the ground looking up. Dali's painting gives us a different perspective. In his painting, we view Christ and the cross from above, looking down, looking down on the clouds and the earth below, as, as it is seen from a heavenly perspective, from God's perspective. Interestingly, 
Christ on the cross shares the same perspective as the Father. Christ views, Christ's view follows and continues that of the Father, looking down on the people and the earth below. The bottom scene, a boat and two fishermen, might remind us of the account of James and John tending their nets and being called by Jesus to come follow me. As I think of the scene of Christ's crucifixion described in the Gospels, I'm reminded of how the people present there each saw Christ and the cross from a unique perspective, and how what they were seeing spoke differently to each of them. Take Jesus' mother Mary, for example. She was present at the cross, maybe looking up or maybe avoiding looking up at her firstborn son hanging on the cross. She saw the cross from the perspective of a mother, probably tears filling her eyes, deeply pained by what was happening, and, and possibly recalling those words she had er heard spoken earlier in the temple by Simeon some 33 years ago. A sword will pierce your very soul. Also at the cross were some Roman soldiers. They were simply following their orders for the day. Executing criminals on a cross was just part of their day's work, something routine, although I wonder if it ever really became routine. They were basically indifferent to all that was going on, their only interest in casting lots for Jesus' garments. <clears throat> and there were Jesus' disciples, at least one who saw the cross up close, possibly others observing it from the perspective of the distance. John 19, 26, and 27 implies that John was probably present at the cross. We know when Peter heard the rooster crow three times in the scripture, says he went away weeping bitterly. I can imagine Peter standing at a distance weeping, feeling a gut-wrenching pain, crushed and guilt-stricken by his denial of Jesus. And I can imagine that somewhere in the shadows was the enemy, Satan himself, gloating. The very Son of God was dying on that cross. Satan and his forces of evil had won the day. And of course, there was Jesus. Jesus had a very unique perspective. He was looking down on all of these, the women, his mother, the soldiers, those who had plotted his crucifixion. He was looking down on them all. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Dear woman, here is your son. Here is your mother. Jesus looked down on them all and saw them through eyes filled with love. What about us? We see the cross through the perspective of time and through eyes of faith. So what do you see? What is the message of the cross for you? In those words in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul speaks of two different perspectives of the cross and the one who was crucified there. One perspective sees the whole idea of the cross and Christ crucified as foolish. The other, to those being saved, the cross and Christ crucified is the very power of God. The Jews and the Greeks, the spiritually blind, the seekers of human wisdom, Paul says, see Christ crucified as foolish. The Jews want to see signs from heaven. They want to see hard evidence. For them, a crucified Messiah is a stumbling block, an offense. If God is going to save the world, God would do it through the, his mighty power, through a Messiah who would come in with great power and restore the kingdom to Israel. To the Jews of Paul's day, the idea of God's Messiah, that God's Messiah would die on a Roman's cross, was just nonsense. It was outright blasphemous. And scandalous. On the other hand, the Greeks, the unbelievers, those seekers of human wisdom, saw Christ crucified as foolish because of the seeming absurdity of it all. To those who worshipped powerful gods who fought on Mount Olympus, to those who saw human logic and reasoning as supreme, to those who saw humanity as the center of all things, the whole idea of a crucified God was absurd simple superstition. Both the Jews and the worldly Greeks 
Paul says, are perishing because of their rejection of the cross. Then Paul speaks of those who see the cross from another perspective. <clears throat> to those called by God to salvation, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For these, the cross reveals a message of hope. In these few verses of Scripture, Paul is in an awe and invites us to be in awe of God's mysterious plan that comes to completeness in the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. No one then anticipated God would act this way. After all, everyone knows what is strong and what is weak in the world, what works and what doesn't. We know intelligence and wisdom when we see it. Likewise, we know stupidity and foolishness. History tells us who comes out on top in this dog-eat-dog -dog world. Only the strong make it to the top. This is a world where human intelligence and wisdom, guts and courage lead one to the top. It's a world where might makes right and nice guys finish last. Paul says that might well be the way the world works, but it's not the way God works. Such worldly wisdom isn't our salvation. We're not saved by walls or health care plans or mighty armies or nuclear missiles or human leaders. We're saved by what the world sees as foolishness, absurdity, and folly. God on a cross. In God's world, the weak are strong, the foolish are wise. What looks like a dead end somehow leads to life and a kingdom without end. It's this darkest moment in human history when the Son of God hung on a Roman cross that leads to light and to life. We might wonder how those people back then missed it. How do people miss it today? It was there all along. The Bible from the beginning had given multiple clues of how God works in unlikely ways and with unlikely heroes. God started a new nation with a pair of childless senior citizens, Abram and Sarah. God chose the younger child over the older, Jacob over Esau, Joseph over his older brothers. The nation's greatest king was David, the youngest son. God chose the stuttering Moses when there were others who could speak better. Again and again, the prophets pointed to one who would be a shoot from a stump, one who would be despised, one whose appearance was pretty run-of-the-mill, one who was likened to a sheep being led to the slaughter. When he came, he was laid in an animal feeding trough, born to peasants' earthly parents, grew into manhood in an out-of-the-way village called Nazareth. When he spoke, he taught in parables, comparing the things that will really last to a tiny mustard seed, invisible yeast, and a widow's mite. He said things like the meek will inherit the earth, peacemakers will be God's children, the last, the least, the lost will be the first in God's kingdom. All of this pointing to the unimaginable time when Jesus, God's Son, will save humanity by dying on a cross. The cross, the cross speaks of God's wisdom, God's power, and how it is manifest in the most unlikely places and among the most unlikely of people. To those called by God to salvation, Paul says, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. So how did a Roman cross, an instrument of death, become a symbol of hope to those called by God to salvation? Well, it was only by God's foolish plan. God knew from the very moment of rebellion in Eden that humanity could not save itself, that we can't approach God or know God through our own efforts. That's one of the reasons I like the perspective of Dali's painting, it speaks to me of God's wisdom, power, and love. We can't think or feel or act our way up to God. We can't know God or relate to God through our own wisdom. We know God because God reached down. God came down to live among us. And through the cross, God says, I love you. You can't save yourself, but I love you so much I gave you my one and only son. Just believe in the message of his cross. 
as in Dali's painting, God is looking down on us through the cross, calling us to reach up to God. That instrument of death now radiates, radiates the message of God's love and grace and forgiveness and mercy. The cross points us to an, an inverted upside down way of life. The message of the cross and of the Christ who died there challenges the prevailing social order. In his book, The Upside Down Kingdom, Don Crable writes, Jesus rankled the rich who oppressed the poor. He healed and shelled grain on the Sabbath. He ate with sinners and accepted tax collectors. He welcomed the prostitutes anointing touch. He traveled with women in public. His parables stung religious leaders. He walked freely with Samaritans and Gentiles. He healed the sick. He blessed the helpless. He touched lepers. He entered pagan homes. The message of the cross, if we can perceive it, is about God who is and what God has done. The cross of Christ speaks the awesome love of God who loves the world he created so much that his one and only son would die there to redeem God's fallen creation. It speaks of love, mercy, and forgiveness. Its message is one of hope. The cross of Christ challenges those who have been called by God to salvation to echo its message and to live out its message in a lost and broken world. So take a moment and look at the cross once again. What word is the cross speaking to you? What message do you hear? To some, it speaks words of foolishness. It's just an emblem of suffering and shame. But to others, to those who've been called by God to salvation, it speaks of the very wisdom and power of God. It speaks of the most amazing love that has ever been known. When you hang that silver cross around your neck, when you put it into your pocket, when you look at the cross, what message does it speak to you? Would you pray with me? Loving God, during this Holy Week, we need to hear clearly the message you have spoken to us through your Son, Jesus, through his suffering and death on a cruel wooden cross. In these days in which we are living, we need to be reminded again and again that your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, that your weakness is stronger than human strength. Help us find your wisdom and the strength for living these days in the message of Christ's cross. As we find ourselves confined to home and separated from family and our brothers and sisters in faith, through your Holy Spirit in us, remind us that we are not alone. You are always with us. You are our hope and strength. When we are feeling frightened and alone, speak to us through the cross. Open our hearts to its wonderful and powerful message. As we look to the cross, speak to us again of how you chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, how you chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong, how you chose what is low and despised in the world to reduce to nothing the things that are. Speak to us those words of assurance that Christ Jesus is for us, your wisdom, righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. As we contemplate Christ's cross, overwhelm us with your love. In Christ's powerful and holy name we pray. Amen.